first let me say uh, it is very nice to be here uh, every month or whenever my SCB magazine comes I look in there the first place I go to is in the back to see who got new members and I think the tip of Tigers has like one page always dedicated to y'all because y'all get like 20 members every month don't you? So uh, this is the most people I've ever seen in an SCB meeting anywhere, and I've been in two divisions since I joined way back in '91. Wow. So uh, y'all are y'all are impressive, and uh, we hear a lot of good things about y'all down where we are. We have a small camp, about 22 folks right now, but we have a very active core, and we're doing a lot of stuff. And uh, y'all are welcome to visit us anytime. The only reason I brought Mike along is in case I had a flat tire. I didn't want to get dirt. <laughs> Mike is probably the only uh, the only Yankee for uh, quite a ways around who's a commander of an SCB camp right now. Although he has southern uh, he has southern ancestry. We've got one in the car. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Well, you're not alone. I'm not alone. Uh, I just lived there, but I'm not I'm not a Yankee. I'm not. A, well, hopefully I can read my script here. If I don't, I'll just have to wing it a little bit. Uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, the title is called Defending the Standard. Uh, this is one of the first programs I ever put together. Like I said, my camp has 22 folks. We have about 15 folks who show up on, on a monthly basis because we have a lot of folks who live out of town. So I wind up doing a lot of programs. Uh, Brandon does a lot of programs. And occasionally Mike's wife, who's the UDC, President, she does a lot of programs. So, uh, out of necessity, I do a lot of programs. <laughs> Mark said that we're going to talk about flags tonight. Flags are a bit of what we're going to talk about. When I talk about standards, I'm not talking about just flags. Um, I have a background in uh, military history. And I took that when I was making this program. I said, well, I'm going to post, of course, it's a Civil War program because we're talking to an SCB camp. But I'm also going to go out on a limb and throw in some other stuff. So folks that are familiar with military history or uh, any type of uh, world history, you'll be familiar with some of the stuff I'm going to show in here. Uh, social conditions, politics, you know, they change from day to day. But the one thing that remains constant about a country or a nation or a people are their symbols, their flags, their standards, especially among the military. Uh, men have cried over them. They've died over them. They've furled them. They've covered their dead with them. So flags are very important, especially to us here in the South. We know about the importance of flags. There was a time when the national flag, especially one carried into battle, was looked upon with reverence and a lot of respect. But nowadays, as I'm sure you're all aware, a lot of people think nothing about the flag, U.S., Confederate, or anything else. It's just something they look at when they go to a sports event before the game starts. The disrespect shown, uh, even if it's unintentional, usually shows a lack of knowledge on the part of these people, and they just don't understand the drama that's been acted out under all these flags, especially the stars and bars, the stars and stripes through whatever era of history. The soldiers throughout the ages have always had a special relationship with the symbols of their nation. Whether it's a flag, a streamer, uh, a statue, or any other visible national symbol. Uh, my talk, like I said, I'm going to go a little bit beyond the Civil War. We're going to jump back and forth in time. And we're going to look at some symbols from other ages and other eras. But we're also going to bring it back and see how all the soldiers in those eras, they're all pretty much the same. They fought and they died for their symbols. And we'll look at that as we go through. Even though they might have been from other countries, other continents, soldiers are pretty much the same all over. Now, our focus, like I said, being in the SCV uh, on the Civil War, we know that the armies of the time carried flags at the front of their formations. How many, how many reenactors we got in here? Anybody other than me? <laughs> no? We don't have any reenactors in here? Wow. Color guards. Color guards? Anybody do anything? 
That's okay. I'm the only one in my camp too right now. But if you've been to our Civil War reenactment, you'll see when the battle lines move forward, usually there's a flag at the front of it, especially if it's any size. Uh, in battle, a Confederate regiment usually carried one flag, like you see here on this slide. Sometimes two. If they had a state flag or some other flag they like to carry. Now you will see some Yankee pictures in here, so no cat calls, please. <laughs> the Union regiments carried two flags. Normally, they carried the Stars and Stripes, and they also carried a regimental flag, which is usually a blue flag with an eagle or some other design on it. The flag served several purposes. In practical use, they identified the unit and served as a rally point, especially in the smoke and confusion of black pirate warfare. Its other purpose was a little bit more subtle, but it was no less powerful. It was the visual embodiment of the duty the soldiers had undertaken. In the South, that duty was usually assigned to them by the women folk of the area. That was a calculated gesture that ensured that Southern womanhood would be upheld. Here's an example of a flag that was presented to the 13th Virginia, and it says, uh, presented by the ladies of Gordonsville. Now, down in my area, we had a lady called Miss Annie Vaughn. And this is what uh, she said on the day that she presented the Company D flag to the 24th Mississippi, which is the Caledonia Rifles. She said, soldiers brave and true, we commit this banner to your hands, feeling well assured, I knowing that its beautiful folds will never be lowered or trailed in the dust, so long as the warm lifeblood that flows through the brave hearts and strong arms of a single Caledonia rifleman. Again, here they go, in the name of the fair daughters of this neighborhood, I present you this banner, knowing that, although it may be tattered and torn upon the fields of battle, it shall prove the winding sheet of the last Caledonia rifleman that remains to unfurl it aloft before it is disgraced. As Saul said to David when he went forth to meet Goliath, the boasting Philistine, go and may the Lord be with you. What kind of southern man is going to let down a lady who has put it that way and has thrown in some Bible to finish off with? That type of scene was typical through the South in 1861. In Louisiana, a lady presented her the colors to the DeSoto Rifles. She asked them, she said, let it not only inspire you with brave and patriotic ambition of the soldier, aspiring to his own and his country's honor, but also it may be a sign that cherished ones appeal to you to save them from the fanatical and heartless foe. We all know who she was talking about there. The fanatical and heartless foe in the north did the same thing. A lady in Michigan presented a flag to a, a regiment there and said, The eagle of American liberty has perched on this banner, which we now give to your keeping. Let your trust be in the god of battles to defend it. And defend it they did. Almost every regimental history of the war on both sides takes note of the courage and sacrifice of color bearers. The presence of the colors in this battle line was a great morale builder, and the loss of a flag was considered a dishonor. Both sides knew this, and they singled out standard bearers for unusually heavy fire. It's normally Company E, if I remember correctly. Thousands of men who obtained this coveted position of color bearer, whether by assignment or circumstance, died in combat while performing the duty. But there was never a shortage of men to want to take up the colors. There was always volunteers for the color guard. <coughs> After the Battle of Seven Pines, Colonel Jenkins of the Palmetto Sharpshooters, whose flag you see here, said that, quote, in my two companies, out of 80 men who entered, 40 were killed and wounded, and out of 11 in the color guard, 10 were shot down. And my colors pierced by nine balls, passed through four hands without touching the ground. And that's in the official report that shows you how much emphasis they placed on saving and keeping the colors. And you see some of the bullet holes in this flag. This flag, actually, uh, I got this off an auction site. This was in the hands of a private collector, and it was auctioned off. 
The Sharpsburg, the 1st Texas Infantry, lost eight color bearers in succession. There's their flag, the real one. At Gettysburg, the 26th North Carolina lost 14. And this is a painting of their colonel uh, taking up the flag before he was shot. And here's the flag of the 26th. You know, the world should count itself fortunate that during that period that we were fighting amongst ourselves and not trying to take over the rest of the world. Because with men like these, we probably wouldn't have done it, or at least our hemisphere anyway. Mm -hmm. But the Yanks and the Revs, they were just the latest at this time in a long line of soldiers who'd been giving up their lives to protect their symbols and their flags and their banners. Some of the most famous standards in the ancient world were carried by the Roman army. This particular, this is a reenactment group from Great Britain called the Ermine Street Guard. If you're a Roman reenactor, this is the group you model yourself after. The Roman army's uh, standard formation was the legion, which is a self-contained unit of heavy and light infantry, auxiliary troops, like archers, slingers, cavalry, and some support troops. And all these troops were trained in basic engineering techniques. They were all a mix of volunteers and conscripts, and they had to meet physical and moral requirements. The typical legion varied in size, like the regiments. The regiment in the Civil War was about 1,000 men at full strength, uh, a legion at full strength was about 8,000 men, but that varied from about five to eight. We bring up the legions because that was one of the first organized professional armies in history. They had standards and banners, just like armies that followed them. Uh, the combined arms approach of the legion was actually tried by the Confederacy uh, early in the Civil War. A CS legion consisted of elements of infantry, artillery, and cavalry all under one commander. Uh, examples of this is jo uh, Cobb's Georgia Legion and the Jeff da Davis Legion. Excuse me. Uh, the theory was that the Legion was self-contained and it didn't have to rely on other units to support it. But after a while, a lot of the Army commanders complained and the Legions were broken up and their respective arms were doled out to other formations. Each Roman legion carried uh, different types of standards, some of which you see here. I don't think they're working. We've got some here. The guys carrying the poles, that's what they're doing. This is an example of what they would carry. Uh, the guy on this side, this is a legion banner or a vexillium. This is what they considered their flag back then. This is more of a banner than the flag that we know today. It had the number of the legion. It also had some sort of little symbol that uh, identified it specifically with that group. The standard on the right, which you can kind of see, it's a little bit off there, but this is called a signum. This is a, what would a cohort would carry. There were 10 cohorts to a legion. Just like in the Civil War, we had uh, so many companies that make up a regiment, and well, the cohorts made up the legion, and each cohort had its own little uh, signum. The most important Roman standard, and the most famous through history, was the eagle. This is a photo of an eagle bearer for that group. The eagle was important because it was touched by the hand of the emperor. When the legion was formed, the emperor assigned them their eagle. It was mounted atop a pole. Sometimes it was uh, plain wood. Other times the entire shaft would be covered with gold. To lose an eagle in battle, which was symbolic of Rome and the power of the emperor, was a devastating disgrace. And most commanders that did so were either lucky to be killed in battle or they would take their lives afterwards. You don't see any instances of civil war commanders killing themselves with their flag up there. Now the most famous occurrence that the eagles are involved in is what was called the Tudorburg Forest Massacre. This took place in 9 AD. The Emperor Augustus had appointed a guy named Varus to command five legions on the German frontier. At the time, that was probably the worst place you could go to because the Germans were always attacking Roman settlements. Well, this fellow Varus, he was not a very good soldier. In fact, he was a politician by trade, but he had got this job through connections because his niece was married to Augustus. So he decides to make a name for himself and at the same time, wipe out all the other Germans that were still opposing the Romans, he decides he's going to take three legions into the uh, 
the unexplored part of Germany and wipe out these tribes. Well, if any of you know the story, there was a guy on his staff named Arminius, and he was a loyal Roman ally from the Germans. But actually, he was a mole. He was one of the German leaders, and he planned, once he heard about what Varus was going to do, he planned an operation to hopefully take down uh, Varus and his command. Uh, Varus was warned by his men, saying, hey, you can't trust this guy, but he didn't listen, and the three legions, about uh, 20,000 men, marched off into the German forest. Now, to reach the area where he thought the enemy was concentrated, he took the 17th, 18th, and 19th legions. They marched through the woods and the swamps into this place called the Tudorburg Forest. Once the army was deep into the forest, and at a certain point in their march, Arminius and his buddies slipped away, and they launched their ambush on the uh, Roman army. They trapped them between a mountain and a marsh. There was like a little narrow place in between, and that's where they struck. It's kind of a depiction of what happened. The Romans couldn't go into the marsh, they couldn't go up the mountain because the Germans had built barricades all up the side of the mountain, so they were trapped pretty good. After a two-day running fight, Varus saw that all was lost and he killed himself. And all three eagle standards were captured. Estimates of the Roman dead are from 17 to 20,000 and only about 400 men managed to fight their way out and report. We were having a bad day for 48 hours. Now Augustus was in such shock the three highly trained legions would be so utterly destroyed that he would wander about the palace for weeks at all hours of the day and night shouting, Varus, Varus, bring me back my eagles. And why were the eagles important? Because he had touched them. He had dedicated them to the legions and they had lost them. And now they were in the hands of barbarians somewhere as a symbol of their victory over Rome. Another thing that was very troubling to him was that 12% of the Roman army had just disappeared on probably one of the worst frontiers they had. And it took them almost 10 years to regain that strength because they could not be quickly replaced. We talk about how mad he was and how angry he was at the loss of the colors or loss of his standard. If a Confederate or a Union regiment lost their colors, they would normally have new ones coming from a government depot or they'd get another one from back home if they still had the strength to stay active. The circumstances of the loss were always taken into account in the Civil War, however bad the regiment might feel about it. And there's our, this is uh, the picture of Germanicus uh, going into the forest and finding what was left of the, uh, the Roman army. They killed all these guys, like 15, 16,000 guys. They just left them where they lay. They didn't bury any of them. Now, General William Barksdale from Mississippi, writing to his headquarters after the Chancellorsville battle, reported the following, quote, I have the honor to report that the 18th Mississippi Regiment lost its colors in the recent engagement there in this place, contending with at least 20 to 1 of the enemy. No other colors were lost by this brigade, and we took none from the enemy. Did you hear the word in there? He says, I have the honor to report. Well, my colors got lost, but it was... 10 to 1? 20 to 1? So he wasn't mad. He was proud of the way his regiment fought. Well, these captured Roman eagles, unlike the Confederate banners that would be replaced, they were not replaced. If they found them, that was good, but they would never be reissued. The legion's numbers, 17th, 18th, and 19th, after 9 AD, they were never reassigned to another legion. That was how big the shame was. And if the conduct of the men caused an eagle to be captured, uh, the commander could order decimation, which was the, the execution of one man in every ten of either the cohort or the entire legion. <laughs> yeah, military justice is pretty final. Right there. Caesar's first Roman invasion in 55 B.C. might have ended in failure if not for the eagle bearer of the 10th legion. 
as the Roman ships were approaching the shores, the beach, uh, the soldiers could see the shoreline was crowded with thousands and thousands of screaming, naked, half-painted Celtic warriors, our way back southern ancestors. They were just waiting for the Roman troops to get off those ships. The legion, legionnaires were like, I ain't getting off. <laughs> Now knowing that something had to be done to get the attack moving, the eagle bearer of the 10th legion leapt out of the boat and into the water. He walked a few yards and he turned around and he says, Men of the 10th, will you betray your standard to the enemy? And then he kept going. Well, his plea broke the spell and those men were not going to be dishonored. They jumped out of the boat and they fought their way ashore and they established a beachhead. But the threat of losing a flag or a standard was a last resort risk that was taken by many standard bearers to motivate their men. At Gaines Mill, the 5th New York Zouaves, they were taking a terrible beating at the hands of the 1st South Carolina. And the men were falling in heaps, including most of the color company. A stroke, a heat stroke overcame the bearer of the regimental colors, this fellow here, John Barron, raised them up and advanced 30 yards in front of his battle line. Well, looking up and inspired by that, the U.S. color bearer also came forward, although the officers were yelling at him, come back, come back. Well, seeing these two men defying the withering Confederate fire, the rest of the unit surged forward and poured a, quite a bit of lead in the tree line with the South Carolina troops were. But the Southern boys held their ground, and the Union line practically melted away from the musket fire that greeted them. This color guard was practically wiped out to a man, and the small brass eagle on top of the colors was shot away. Both flags were shredded. The 5th New York retired with 162 dead out of 450, but they did not lose their flags. We've been talking about the eagle, the Roman eagle. We have an eagle on the top of this flagpole. It's been a popular symbol throughout history. And other than the United States, where we carried eagles or at least the Union did on top of their flagpoles. Other nations that favored the eagle were Germany, Austria, and Russia. Perhaps the most famous representation of the eagle outside of Rome was in the French army under Napoleon Bonaparte, the embodiment of his imperial authority on the battlefield. And as we all know, Napoleon was a great uh, influence on uh, our generals in the Civil War, both North and South. In 1804, when Napoleon came to power, the French regimental flags were mostly for show. It was the pole they were attached to that was the important thing. At the top of that pole, you would find one of these, the regimental eagle of the French. It was made out of bronze, and it had the regimental number. In this case, we have 45 there. The eagle itself is not worth a whole lot, but it was the psychological value of this eagle in the regiment. This and other ones, like the uh, eagles that were sanctified by Augustus, these were presented to the regiments by Napoleon himself. And if they lost them, it was like they had uh, you know, slapped the emperor in the face by losing his property. Many units, particularly dragoons, which were heavy cavalry, the line and the light infantry, and uh, some others were ordered to return their eagles before setting out on a campaign. But many disobeyed the order. Can you imagine uh, General Bragg telling you know his Confederate regiments, "Hey, leave your battle standards at home. That way they won't be captured." I can't imagine that. At that time, the height of personal glory in the Napoleonic Wars was if you were a soldier on the other side, capturing one of these eagles. There are great tales of those guarding the eagles suffering numerous wounds, even death, while defending these. One of the most celebrated losses of the French Eagle came at Waterloo, where Sergeant Charles Ewart of the Scots Grays Cavalry captured the, as they called it, the cuckoo, from the French 45th line that was that Eagle we saw a while ago. He had to kill at least three soldiers to get to it, and he was rewarded with a commence, uh, uh, commission to Ensign, which was the lowest officer rank at that time. During the 1812 campaign in Russia, the French lost 14 eagles in combat and destroyed five to prevent their capture. Two were abandoned on the field and simply picked up. Conditions in Russia were so severe in the winter of 1812 that at least one eagle color guard froze to death in the 
The Russians found the trophies just lying in the snow next to the dead bodies of the fellow guard. We mentioned that because one of our well-known personages from the Civil War, Sam Watkins, had a similar but less gruesome encounter. Uh, this happened to him when he fell out of ranks after being hit near Atlanta. He happened to pick up an abandoned Union flag, and in his own words, he says, quote, as long as I was in action fighting for my country, there was no chance for promotion. But as soon as I fell out of ranks and picked up a forsaken and deserted flag, I was promoted for it to fourth corporal. And had I known that picking up flags entitled me to promotion, and that every flag I picked up would raise me one notch higher, I would have quit fighting and gone to picking up flags. <laughs> and by that means, I would have soon have become president of the Confederate States of America. <laughs> I didn't realize there were so many flags just laying around. On the other side, the Union troops boasted of capturing many Southern flags at the Mill Springs, Kentucky battle. When truth be told, all they did was capture a Confederate wagon train where all the company flags were stored. So they captured like 20, 30 different flags. Now, although some standards and flags were left behind in panic and confusion, most were defended to the death by the men that had charge of them. Color Sergeant Rice of the 28th Tennessee Infantry down by a bullet at Murfreesboro, crawled along on his knees and clutched his unit's flag until another shot brought death. During the height of the same battle, opposing lines of the 19th Texas dismounted and a federal infantry unit were very close. A Yankee standard bearer stood immediately to the front of Texas Color Sergeant Sims, waving his flag and urging his troops forward. Sergeant Sims, taking this action as a direct insult, rushed forward, planted his own flagstaff firmly on the ground, and lunged for the Union colors. And at that very moment, both men were shot down. And their commander reported they were waving their banners above their heads until the last expiring moments. <coughs> the Texas flag was rescued, but not before one more man was killed trying to retrieve it. Often, the uh, protection and recovery of a standard got out of hand, and it took precedence over the tactical objectives of a fight, such as here in the wheat field, where the combat raged back and forth. Uh, there was an example of a, of a Union colors were taken, and you see here the guy is trying to get them back, and he was bayoneted seconds later. And just to wrap up the history of the French Eagles, uh, when Bonaparte uh, fell from power the first time, uh, the French king that had come back to power ordered all the Eagles destroyed. When Napoleon came back in 1815, he had more eagles produced, but the quality was not as good as the originals. And finally, after Waterloo, his final defeat, most eagles were again destroyed. However, there are about 130 left in museums and private collections. Most of his eagles were destroyed out of spite, but many times units hid or destroyed their flags and standards to spare them from the disgrace of being captured or paraded by the enemy. Uh, at the end of the Napoleonic uh, period, as Allied forces closed in on Paris, a French marshal was so angry at the thought of the capital being captured that other than his own flags that he burned, he also went and got all the battle trophies that they had collected over the last couple of hundred years, took them out, and burned all of them. That way the powers that were coming in couldn't get them back. We're talking like 1,500 flags from Britain and Austria and Germany and all these other places. One night after the 7th Louisiana Infantry was captured at Rappahannock Station in Virginia, the color bearer revealed to his comrades that he had hidden their battle flag when they were overwhelmed. Determined not to let it become a prize of the Yankees, they burned their cherished banner in the campfire. As his unit retreated across the Appomattox River, the color bearer of the 44th North Carolina tore the unit flag from its staff wrapped it around a stone and flung it into the river, declaring that no enemy will ever have the flag of the 44th North Carolina. A member of the 7th Tennessee Cavalry recorded the solemn scene as Nathan Bedford Forrest Command prepared to surrender to the Yankees. He said, quote, the old bullet-torn flag 
whose blue cross had been triumphantly borne aloft for years at the cost of so much blood and valor they would never part with. On the eve of the surrender, as the shadows of night fell, the men reverently gathered around the staff in front of regimental headquarters, and cutting the silk into fragments, each soldier carried away with him a bit of that coveted treasure. The flag had been a gift of a young lady of Aberdeen, Mississippi, made from her bridal dress, and had never for an instant been abandoned by the men of the 7th Tennessee after it was committed to their guardianship. <coughs> They may have had to surrender, but they weren't going to disgrace the flag that had been entrusted to them by that young southern lady so many years before. You have to wonder how many battle flags wound up as strips of cloth and forgotten in people's attics. Some units couldn't bring themselves to part with their banners, and they held on to them as long as they could. The Union General Joshua Chamberlain, upon overseeing the formal surrender the Army of Northern Virginia wrote that the unit stacked arms and reluctantly, with agony of expression, they tenderly folded their flags, battle-worn and torn, blood-stained, heart-holding colors, and laid them down. The Army of Northern Virginia surrendered 71 flags that day, which went with other captured flags to Washington, not to return to our southern uh, birthplaces until 1905. Some kept in northern state houses like Minnesota have still not come home. Now the era of the great armies marching into battle with flags at their head came to a close in the late 19th century with the advent of more deadly weapons and tactics that changed because of them. As the war became more mechanized and communications means improved, flags, banners, and standards were normally left behind at headquarters to be used only for ceremonial purposes. Flags and standards are too conspicuous in the modern warfare uh, from World War I to the present day because concealment and camouflage is the order of the day. Now, there were exceptions to this, <coughs> such as the torch landings in North Africa in 1943. You see here we have a old glory right there. They took that large American flag ashore because they wanted the French to know who they were and please don't shoot us. Most of them liked Americans, so they didn't shoot them. Uh, they're also, if you watch uh, some of the uh, World War II movies like Band of Brothers and some of the other D-Day movies, remember they all had like a large flag armbands on their arms when they jumped into France. Same, same thing. In modern warfare, <coughs> flags are primarily used in the combat zone as symbols of victory. They carry Iwo Jima. These are brought out when the soldiers want to claim a piece of land and show the enemy and their own people that they have conquered. Any Marines in here? No Marines, really? Wow. Any Air Force people in here? <laughs> Woo! Okay. 20 years, baby. Right. All by one? All by one? 20 years before. Uh, on another part of Kojima, that was going on. And uh, you see, uh, I know if you go on the internet, you'll see pictures like this through World War II, through Vietnam. Um, as it gets closer to our home time, you don't see as much unless guys are like posing with them. And lastly, you probably all remember this from several years back when we uh, rolled into Baghdad City. The guy went up on the tank uh, uh, recovery vehicle and was uh, playing with Saddam statue. Put the American flag over his face, upside down, I might add. Although the day of the true battle standard is over, the mass produced versions of U.S. and Confederate flags that we all buy still carry an inherited honor and heritage of the sacrifice these men went through. They should always be treated with respect and reverence. Brave men throughout the ages have defended their flags and standards and symbols in the test of combat, many giving their lives to protect their cherished banners. We should always remember this whenever they attack our flags. This is one of my favorite paintings. This is called Fight for the Colors. Uh, my grandfather was in the 2nd Mississippi Infantry Company K which is where this painting was uh, 
depicted to be at the height of the battle. Two color bearers are fighting over. The Mississippi troops, the Wisconsin troops are attacking. Uh, my grandfather was in the railroad cut. He did survive, but he was wounded and was captured uh, when the army pulled out. And he's buried up in Brooklyn, New York. And to close, I have a quote from an old, uh, there was an old series on British television. I'm sure they've showed it over here. It was called Sharp. It was about a uh, lieutenant in a rifle company during the Napoleonic Wars. In one of the episodes, there's an intelligence officer trying to convince him to lead a small Spanish village in uprising against their French <coughs> occupiers. The key to the fight is an old banner that they've been carrying around with them through the mountains. And the Spanish forces carried it against the Muslim invaders centuries before. And they're having this argument, and Sharp asks the Major, he says, do you really expect that men will fight and die for a rag on a pole? And the officer looks at him and says, you do, you do. I thank you for your attention, and thank you for having us. Well, that's probably way more you want to learn about the Roman army, but being a military uh, major in uh, history, I, sometimes I just know stuff that. If you'll notice behind you here, and it's holding our uh, camp flag, looks like what's on top of the